South Africa. On the line, finally we managed to get hold of him, is someone that I'm sure would have known Brett pretty well and, and he wasn't a half bad bowler himself, Merrick Pringle on the line from Cape Town. Hi Merrick. Hi, how are you guys doing? Yeah, fine, Sorry. fine. You are in Cape Town, eh? I'm in Cape Town in this lovely weather we've got here at the moment. Yeah, here it's fantastic. It's absolutely wonderful. Red wine, red wine. Which side of the mountain are you on? Because that's all we tried about 30 times to get through to you. I'm on the other side of Durbanville on a small holding. So the reception area out here is not, not too great. Okay, all right. Well, I'm glad we got hold of you eventually. How are you keeping? Yeah, no, good. All good. Um, left India a couple of weeks ago in 40 degrees. Um, to come here in 10, 7, 5 degrees, it's not, not, a, not good. Yeah, yeah, but um, well, you're on a small holding out past Durban, but what, what are you doing these days? Are you farming? No, 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 I bought a small holding about four years ago, and uh, I only started building about two years ago. So I, I come from that farming background and the, uh, the outdoors, uh, got a couple of dogs and a couple of horses, I uh, just enjoy it. You guys, yeah, I mean, you've done a fair bit of coaching, you, how's your foundation going? Uh, we've been battling with funding on the foundation for a couple of years now. So I think the uh, companies are uh, hold on to their money and, uh, and, and, and not giving and not giving out. So that's our biggest hassle is the, is the funding on the foundation to keep the operations running. Um, you know, we we do this we do this on our, our spare time and uh, in the evenings, and then it's quite difficult for me to do it from India and, and my cousin Grant to do it from Cape Town, and that and uh, we're both working. Well, thanks very much for joining us on Balls Visual Radio this afternoon. We've got Ben Kopinski here from Follow the Bounce, and uh, we've hey, got Rick. the voice of South African rugby, Hugh Bladen, um, with us as well. We host the show while while Darren's away, so you're in the presence of greatness here. Hi, Mary. Oh, good, good. <laughs> how, are you, how are you, man? Good, thanks. Yeah. Um, good. I was I was thinking you you played in in quite a special time for South African cricket. It was that era just post isolation um, a great group of players, um, a unique time, Brett Schultz, uh, yourself, Clive Rice, Dave Callahan, Daryl Cullinan, Alan Donald, Farney De Villiers, Dante Rhodes, I mean the list the list goes on. And I was thinking this afternoon, how, how do you think that that team compares to the side that we have today? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, like you said, it's a very good side and some talented cricketers there and it's just a pretty, um, you know, the likes of Adrian Caper and, and those type of players that weren't seen earlier and we didn't play international cricket um, earlier. Um, you know, Adrian Caper, you think of how many first class games he's played and all those rebel tours he played and how well he did and yet he only played one test for South Africa when we got back into international cricket. But, um, you know, we played a lot less cricket in those days, and these guys have played a hell of a lot more than what we, not what we did. And I think they trained a lot more than what we did. But, uh, yeah, we certainly had a very good side. with kept the Vespers, um, started off as captain in 92, and then uh, he handed over to Hansi Cornier. So those were really, really good times. No, I mean, they were uh, legend players. I, I'm, I mean, I'm... I'm a spring chicken. I mean, I was 20. I'm 28 now, and I remember watching you guys growing up, and you know those test series against Australia. That means Simon was growing up, not you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was a lighty, and I, I, I mean, you just look at the caliber of player in that team. It, uh, such a fantastic side. Yeah, no, it was a, a super, super side. I mean, I, was, they, they, I could, I could bet if I can say that. But I hardly ever batted with this sort of type of batting lineup that we did have. <laughs> you must have been grateful for that. No, that was the only batting I got was in the net. <laughs> Mary, Mary, just speaking about that, that that great side back in the day in the nineties. I think uh, I think Simon and I were both about ten or eleven years old back then. Now I've been reading this book about uh, the Proteus twenty years of uh, greatest matches, and apparently you guys had a rest day during the test back in those days. No, we didn't. Not not to the, not in the test matches I played. I only unfortunately played four test matches. Um, okay. We we didn't have a break then. No. Okay, probably cause before then. Because I, I heard some some pretty wild stories of uh, you know cruise liners and good jawling like you know in between the, the actual games. That was an absolutely unbelievable tour. That, uh, the Barbados test tour that you're talking about in yeah. the West Indies. Yes, I remember the the boat trip and. Uh, very naughty on the trip uh, in a good way not in a bad way no, of course um, actually yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I, mean, I, I think it was the uh, going into the last day or well, end of the fourth day of that test match um, we all went to the Carib Beach Bar and I'd organised champagne bottles and a uh, live band at the Carib Beach Bar after, after the day's play on the fifth day 
Uh, we only needed 80 or 100 odd runs to win with 8 wickets in hand and uh, Kirtley Ambrose and Courtney Wells tore us apart and we lost that test match. But uh, a very memorable one. It's, uh, not, not to be forgotten for sure. Totally. Mark, I, I think back in those days, you know, I also read Steve Waugh's autobiography. I think he opens up by saying that test cricket used to just be a, a boys drinking club. And like back in the 80s, the only guys that really were professional were the West Indies. They were the only ones that actually had a fitness coach back in those days. The rest of them just had made their own bars. Um, <laughs> do you find that, that sort of like test crickets and all those kind of things are a little bit too serious nowadays? I mean, if you look at kids, you know, wearing helmets from the age of like four, like, like cricket, is it, you know, it's really just taken a little bit too much of a serious slant nowadays? Um, yeah, I mean, look, you know, in between days in the five day test match, uh, we did go out and have a few beers. I think the guys today, they're not allowed to do that, you know, the type of training that they do and the type of trainers that they've got. Um, all these new things that uh, a beer does this to you or whatever whatever alcohol does this to you and be out you the next day. And I think it's just uh, gone on like that. Um, you know, we were never told not to go out and have beers. We were allowed to do what we wanted to do as long yeah. as it was at a reasonable hour, come home, you know. So you're nodding your head there, Blades. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds <Well>, good. <laughs> Well, I knew the days of, of Dennis Lindsay and Tiger Lance and Eddie Parler and Graham Pollock and Peter Pollock and, and guys like that. Roy McLean used to have, you know, sort of spook and diesel. <laughs> I think it <laughs> drinks <laughs> time. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Dennis Lindsay, you know, the late Dennis Lindsay and Tiger Lance, I mean, they're all no longer with us. And what wonderful guys they were. But they drank. I mean, they used to <laughs> <laughs> no, Spook and Diesel <laughs> was a big thing. If I can uh, add Eddie Bala to that, to that list as well, he loved his red wine. Tell you know, Bunter was there as well. I played <laughs> yeah. club cricket against most of those guys. And tell me a little bit about this foundation, America. It interests me. What, what, what are you guys doing there? Um, we, we are it's a single sports and education foundation where we are we identify and underprivileged children, not necessarily um, the, the black people or coloured people. It's also white people. If, if you know we get a, a single parent that's divorced and really can't um, um, see to the kid at school, they're really battling financially and that, and we see that that kid is is seriously talented and a far away, then we try and assist. But um, as I mentioned earlier on, is we just don't have any funding at the moment and we try and have golf days and it's just not enough funding to put one kid through five years of schooling. You know, you know, you need 25,000 rand per kid and then we want to put them in hostel and not send them home. Um, that's another 26 or whatever it is. So it's 50,000 rand a kid per year and we want to have a kid in the foundation for at least five years of their high school. Okay, right. I mean, it sounds like a, a fantastic thing and... and funding would be great yeah look uh, we, we, we are battling in it I mean, there's so many talented uh, kids that I've seen in the townships that I've been in and but there's really nothing I can do I, you know, I keep the, obviously the details and contacts and that and when we do get funding yeah, we'll go find them again mm. yeah great well uh, please give us uh, I'll, I'll get hold of you after this interview but uh, please give us your details and uh, we'll be more than happy to put something up on our website no, thank you, man. That'll be a great help. Um, Mick, I wanted to ask you, well, when I called you to set up, up this interview, I mentioned that um, I wanted to talk to you about uh, this new coaching job you've got in India. You said it was embargoed, and then I said I wouldn't ask. So this is me not asking. Yeah, look, uh, um, I've, I've been coaching at a private academy in India for, for two years in Jaipur, Rajasthan. Um, and towards the end of last season, uh, the Rajasthan first class side were really battling and they were fighting relegation. And, and there were three games left, um, and they had to win two out of those three games to qualify for the quarterfinals. And they, they also um, the current, they were current champions holding the trophy from the season before. So they approached me and asked me if I wouldn't be able to help them and assist them for those last three games. Um, we played Punjab in the, the first game, and uh, we drew that game. Uh, we, we got. Uh, the batting points out of it and then we had to win the next two um, so and they were both home games we prepared a green top uh, played five seamers and we, we bowled them out and we won that game <laughs> nice. and then the, and in the last game we did, we did exactly the same thing again but even greener and we had to win by 10 wickets or by an innings of something runs 
And we did. We won by an innings and, and, and 54 runs. Do you get green uh, tops in India? <laughs> <laughs> you do now. Uh, of course, of course uh, there was the red carpet cut out and, uh, and all those other things. Uh, and, then, and then they went on to quarterfinals. They won that semifinals and they won the finals. They returned the trophy in the champions two years in a row now. Oh, and, well done. Uh, yeah. And then, and then I, I went back to the academy again uh, at the end of the season. And they approached me again now on a full-time basis. Um, okay. So I've, I've recently just got back from India. As, as I have signed the contract. Um, the head coach uh, has, has resigned. Um, so they're not. I'll be more of the head coach, come bowling coach for the under some first for the coming season. So it's very exciting and something new. Um, especially in the subcontinent, it's very difficult. Uh, you've got to get used to the food and. The water, you've got to be careful of how you eat and that type of thing, you know. When do you leave, it, Merrick? Um, I should be back there before the 6th of September. Um, it's, I've got a press conference there on the 4th. Okay. All right. Well, we wish you the best of luck there. Congratulations. No, thank you, man. Thanks a lot. Man. And I just have to ask you, um, before we let you go, uh, two things. Um, firstly, your thoughts very quickly on South Africa as we, as we look to to win the test series we're one nil up we head into the final test at Lords um, what do you think can the guys go 2-0 up they can go 2-0 up I, I, I don't know what England are going to do I, 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 I think it was really ridiculous that they left going swan out in that test match um, in the second test uh, at Headingley but uh, the Oval is going to be I think it's going to be an exciting test match but England uh, have to win this test match and I wouldn't be surprised if they prepared a uh, a bowler friendly wicket um, uh, but the first is have prepared for it I'm sure could be to their detriment yeah it could be could be yeah, I mean, one wonders. We've been speculating all week here about the absence of Kevin Peterson. D- does that type of thing um, affect a team and the the psyche of a team? It w- you know, I haven't uh, read um, into into it too much as to what actually exactly happened there on the Twitter and all his sayings and doings and that with other people. But um, I'm sure. I mean, after him scoring that 149 um, in the second test, it's, it's a huge loss to them and. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't think he's scored runs recently, and then all of a sudden he scores as 149, and he thinks he's God. And uh, you know, <laughs> I think he just opened his mouth a bit too much. Yeah, because we've we've actually thought uh, we were chatting yesterday, and we've, we've struggled to find someone to come out in support of Kevin Peterson. We found a guy named Neil Collins, <laughs> but uh, we spoke to Robert Jackman, and we spoke to Alan Lamb, and everyone. The general consensus is that uh, he deserved what was coming. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, you can just see the way he walks around and that what type of guy he is. And yeah. He, you know, he, he says what, what, what comes, he says. Well, Merrick, thank you. It was great to catch up with you. Um, before I let you go, Darren asked me to ask you about the banana in the shoe incident. Well, it was against Natal. What happened there? It was a lunchtime break and, uh, you know, that Durban heat in mid-summer and that we had bananas in the dressing room and they really got soft and soggy and Brian McMillan got hold of one and put it in my boot and, of course, when I put my, <laughs> foot, my shoe, my foot in, I couldn't feel this thing. It was too soft. And of course, I bowled the first over after lunch, and the, the bloody banana came flying out my, the front of my hole. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because it was—he told me that you were, wasn't sure you were the, you were either playing the pranks or you were the victim of the pranks. I think I just found out no, you were. The vi- I was the victim. Brian McMillan did it. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever get him back? I did. Yeah, I won't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very cool. Thank you. It was great catching up with you, and all the best for your for your new coaching role in India. And good yeah, luck with the foundation. We'll get in touch with you and put those details up on our website. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, Merrick. You. There you go, Merrick Pringle. There from a small holding just outside Durbanville. Nice to catch up with him. Yeah, great. Big, <laughs> big out, banana out, duckers. <laughs> <laughs> we the best on three. One, two, three. We the best. <laughs> Live on balls.co.za. Balls.co.za.